and welcome to Edison Open House Transport Futures 2021. Now in this session we're going to be looking at the work of Centrica, very well known in the UK as a provider of gas and electricity, but it's actually a global beer moth with uh, energy provision solutions in countries all over the world. So with me I have Tom Hart, he is the Head of Portfolio for Energy Management in EV. Hello, Tom. Hello. So tell me a bit more, just paint us the picture of Centrica. So Centrica, as you said, is a global business, um, although increasingly, actually, we are, we are very much focused in the UK market. Um, and uh, I, where I sit in the organisation uh, is within British Gas, which is obviously a very well-known household name. Um, and uh, what, what's interesting, I guess, about the role that, that I do and increasingly how we're starting to look at EV and energy management is trying to bring together all the capabilities from across uh, British Gas and Centrica uh, to create really great solutions to some of the challenges we're facing in both the transport and also the, the broader decarbonisation and net zero uh, agenda. Um, and I personally, I'm very focused on the consumer side, so the likes of, of you and me and um, creating solutions uh, that's going to help everybody um, get to that point of reducing their carbon emissions and towards net zero, um, with a particular focus on transport uh, as well. So Centrica represents a classic energy company really in transition to a different future. Yeah, absolutely. And we've, um, you'll see, you know, over the years, very much a, a transition as a group away from owning large um, uh, large assets, so power stations primarily, um, and exploration as well, um, and much more of a focus more towards um, creating solutions for consumers and business. So I guess in the industry, you kind of call it uh, uh, that, that kind of downstream side of our organization, which is is the, the element that's growing. Um, and we're very focused now on creating uh, those great solutions for consumers and for businesses that's going to help them on that journey. So let's talk about some of those solutions. You produced a really interesting report about the home charging. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, so um, as the you know the rollout of, uh, of electric vehicles um, grows at, at a real pace, what we're seeing is, um, and, and I always think about it in three ways in terms of the consumers at the very least, as they start to, you know, uh, go down that electrification of transport, if for, certainly for their private car. Um, you've got a whole group of customers that are able to charge at home. So they have uh, a, a driveway, where they can have a charge point installed, and that allows them to charge their electric vehicle on the driveway. And that's um, almost the simplest. There are some complexities around that. That's the, almost the easiest um, route uh, for customers to take. If you uh, if you live in a, a shared flat um, or a, a block of flats, sorry, um, then that becomes a little bit more challenging. But there's some options there that we're looking at. And then lastly, um, if you have no parking at all uh, and you're doing um, parking on the street, then that almost presents a, a greater challenge. Um, uh, and there's some interesting solutions, I guess, um, we're looking at. But more broadly, the organ, you know, the the overall um, industry is looking at as well. Um, so yeah, so we we can talk about e all three of those, or or, or uh, focus on a, on a particular one. Because all what of them was interesting, interesting in in the report was that a third of employees indicated employers, sorry, indicated that they were wanting to install home home charging points. And the charging has a double meaning here because they wanted the home charging, but they also wanted the ability for charging, in other words, the billing. Uh, to be uh, for business use to be separate and of course you know that's a whole new area of business for you yes absolutely and, and what we we're almost leading the way uh, and using our, our own fleet um, so we've got one of the big, biggest fleets in the country so British gas vans that you see drive around everywhere um, we made a big commitment to electrify that fleet um, in, in much quicker ahead of the 2030 uh, change actually and that's presenting some interesting opportunities and challenges for us um, and ways for us to learn actually about how we overcome some of those challenges. So, for example, um, all our engineers, when they uh, take their van home at, at the end of the day and they park it on their driveway, um, when they plug in and then start charging, they're able to, uh, to um, they will be reimbursed for all the energy that you, they use. So at the end of the month, um, they get all the money back that they've spent. Um, so when they pay their energy bills, obviously uh, they're not out of pocket. And that's a really simple solution. It all automates and works um, 
without any uh, lots of intervention from that individual. Um, and that's a really important for, for commercial fleets and commercial vehicles where they're paying your vehicle is used primarily or all, all the time for your for work purposes and is then you have it being reimbursed for the energy and that creates a really nice solution for um, for customers and then there's a whole nother area i guess uh, as well on top of that which is you know company cars salary sacrifice and other kind of consumer solutions but yeah from a from a commercial vehicle perspective you know there's some really nice neat, neat solutions i guess that we're creating in the market and do you think the pandemic has accelerated all of this because so many more people are working from home Yes, absolutely. I think looking at, um, at commercial fleets, um, I think we're starting to see this. Um, we've always had a, a return to home fleet, for example, um, but we're also starting to see more and more um, uh, scenarios where companies are looking at their commercial fleets and thinking about actually, do we need to be charging at um, you know hubs, uh, do it at, at uh, depots, sorry, um, or in offices, or actually, can we charge all our, our commercial fleets at home? And that actually goes into the other sectors as well. So thinking about company cars, um, uh, salary sacrifice schemes, and also um, uh, norm, you know, general consumers like, like, like myself, um, where actually what we're starting to see is that people are traveling less to the office. And I have quite a few colleagues actually who used to, because we had charging at our offices, they wouldn't, they wouldn't get a home charge because there was no need to. And all of them are now doing that because at the most, you know, they may be going back to the office once or twice a week. So the need for a home charger um, it becomes even more important, I think, than the workplace charging um, than it was previously, definitely. So there are two new bits of business, you know, installing home charging, uh, chargers and also sorting out the software for reimbursement. And there's another bit of this uh, jigsaw that you're very involved in, which is energy optimization, And, you know, perhaps people uh, charging overnight when electricity prices can be lower. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, the, there's a bit of a progression and a journey, I guess, that um, that we're taking customers on at the moment. Because um, you can look at what I would almost call very simple optimization and very simple kind of scheduling of charging, if you will, um, which is you know ubiquitous today in terms of what um, people are doing. Um, so you, do, you have the off-peak off tariff, so 12 to 5 or 12 in our instance, some are a bit different, 12 to 4, etc. And they, uh, those solutions have been around for quite a while. Um, and uh, when you combine that with uh, the right software solution uh, and the solution that we're actually, that we are, we've recently launched and, and, and really focusing on um, is utilizing the Hive app and the Hive ecosystem, which you, you may know as being, uh, taking a leading role in, in the smart home. So we've got over 2 million customers that are using that solution every day. And we're really starting to shift that away from, uh, well, as well as away from kind of smart home and more towards um, energy management. And the Hive app, which you know is a great kind of solution, very simple and easy for customers to use, that'll be the way that um, you'll be able to interact with your home charger, how you'll be able to um, schedule it to that, to that off-peak uh, period. But that's really just the start, actually, because um, what's interesting is when you think about optimization, if you just look at it in a very simplistic way of going, we're going to shift all the charging to, to 12 to 5, for example, then you create the new peak once you get to that point of, of demand. So everybody kind of switches on at 12 p.m. with those tariffs and that creates a kind of a, a, a new peak, so to speak. What's interesting is um, the, some of the solutions that, you know, that we're working on and others are releasing into the market which actually changed that a little bit. So it's more reactive to what's happening um, in the energy system, the energy market. So one of the, uh, the pieces we'll release later this year, will in essence, you as a consumer, you just tell us, I need my vehicle ready to go to work at 8 a.m. the next day. And what we'll do is that we'll um, make sure you've got a, a level of charge which is acceptable to you, but actually when we charge and how much we charge, um, there'll be some flexibility there. And what that allows is, is rather than just switching all the cars on at 12 o'clock, we can um, start charging your vehicle at a time that is appropriate um, from and, and based on signals we're getting from the grid. So if there is a, an abundance of energy on the grid, um, then uh, we'll start charging your car a little bit earlier. Or, or if there is um, you know, a high peak demand uh, at some time in the evening for whatever reason, then we'll stop charging. Um, but we'll never do it to, at a detriment to the customer. But that's where we start to get into this really interesting space where actually that charger in your home is connected up to the broader energy system, uh, which allows you to uh, allows us to help balance the grid uh, and reward customers 
to allow us to do that. So you could charge your car and actually be paid to do it. Absolutely, yeah. That's the that's the the future, and that's I think where we're starting to go. I think as a, as an as an industry, and, and certainly the the direction of travel with the solutions that we're that we're creating. Um, so that flexibility services is is huge actually in 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 home charging, um, but also more broader than that. Um, you know, as I said at the start, I look after energy management more broadly in the home, um, and you, you can link all these devices together. Um, so whether it's a heat pump, which interestingly you is, is actually a great source of providing flexibility because um, you can shift load around. Um, whether it's a home battery, solar, we can optimize energy within the home, which is really, really important because actually optimizing for self-consumption is actually crucial um, because exporting energy to the grid actually is not you know, very cost effective or beneficial to consume. So you want to optimize for self-consumption as much as possible. Um, but then uh, it's great as well alongside that to be able to provide flexibility services um, to the grid and, and help keep the lights on, so to speak. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing home solutions, which are actually going to be a major you know, kickstart to people owning electric vehicles, because if they think that they can you know, be paid to charge their car, then you know they will flock to electric cars. So all these things are connected yes absolutely and i think that's one of the kind of big themes that we're starting to see actually where um you know traditionally two very separate industries um are starting to to really converge so in the past we had energy companies that were focused on on homes and powering homes and businesses and um obviously uh you know the um maybe the traditional oil and gas um uh, organizations you know powering your uh, powering your car and those two are starting to merge from both sides, actually. So whether it's, you know, you're coming from the energy side, such as the Central British Gas or, or one of the oil majors, obviously, that are, are coming in from a slightly different angle. And um, all of us are starting to, to really converge into that into that single space. Now, can I mention storage heaters? Now, storage heaters for non-UK uh, viewers to this are a bit of a kind of a, a mother-in-law type joke in, in Britain. They appeared in the 1970s. Uh, you turned them on at night. They were not beautiful. They were very much, a, 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 along with the strange wallpapers of the time, storage heaters went along with that too. And we had night storage. But actually, Tom, storage heaters or storage devices are presumably now going to make a comeback. Yes, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, touching on storage heaters specifically, actually, they've got a bit of a bad rap, um, storage heaters. And we've they seen that. In life. They were very <laughs> ugly. <laughs> they were. They were very ugly. And, and, uh, and what I'd say, anybody who has that picture in their mind is um, some organisations, uh, and there are, many, there are many around, but I'll mention kind of Glenn Dimplex because they're quite quite big in this market. But some of their new, uh, their, their new solutions, A, are a lot more attractive but also are a lot more flexible in terms of how they can, can power uh, provide heat to your home. Um, but there is a bit of a, a, a kind of a, a stigma to get over. But what's interesting actually about um, storage heaters, and I'll come on to store, storage more broadly in a second, is they, they enable large amount of flexibility um, to when you heat it and when you, you know, when you don't, and actually you can again provide that flexibility in the same way as we do with electric vehicles to um, you know to the grid essentially both locally and nationally um, but that's not the that's probably one example the other example which is a really um, quite interesting and it changed my kind of perception when we started um, looking at this is um, hot water so we work very closely with a company called Mixergy and it was the first product that we integrated um, into what we kind of call the virtual power plant. So all those um, smart hot water cylinders are connected up to our virtual power plant. Um, and that enables us to provide, use those um, hot water cylinders to provide flexibility. And we, my, I, you know, many people don't really think about this, but actually water and water sitting in a cylinder, uh, you know, is... Um, uh, is a is a something you can use uh, uh, as a flexibility, a store of heat, so to speak, and a store of energy, um, and that's what we're doing. So um, you know, today we have um, quite a number now of, uh, of mixed cylinders that are connected up effectively to the to the grid, if you will, um, and we use those cylinders to provide um, flexibility. So we'll sometimes um, heat up the hot water. Um, 
when uh, when it's an appropriate time or, or will pause the heating and actually from a consumer perspective more broadly on mixergy it's a great solution can actually only heats the water you need and actually learns and understands um, when it's appropriate to uh, and how much water you need uh, i guess to um, on a morning depending on how many people you've got in the house and what your kind of daily rhythm is so that's one example of actually using uh, you know hot water cylinders as a way to provide flexibility and then that goes into you know uber mediums as well whether you call a you know a battery a high battery um, and other things so actually storage is quite an interesting opportunity for to provide that additional flexibility and even goes into you know for things even more future focused when everybody's got those EVs um, sat on their driveway, that is a battery that you can um, potentially use to, to help power the home. Again, that kind of optimization piece. Once we get over some of the barriers, so that v, v to G or um, uh, v, v to H as we call it, or V to X, because um, actually most of the time you'll be using your vehicle to charge your, your home, not necessarily exporting it. So all these storage solutions, including EVs, start to create well, it's quite an interesting opportunity, I think, for, for the energy system. Yes, yeah, so you think about you know, storage heaters and hot water, but actually you should see the, the electric vehicle battery, the storage heater, as part of a connected system, which, uh, which is helping managing uh, power. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, if you uh, think to the future, and what's really interesting is a, and there's an example, that, uh, and we think about the retrofit market, but we also think about the new build market as well. And what's really interesting, actually, is that when you look at new homes that are being built, and this is changing, we're working actually with a house builder at the moment, um, putting all these solutions in side by side um, create a really exciting opportunity because you know, you'll have a home that's got a charger that's connected to, a, to an electric vehicle that's also got you know, a heat pump, um, you know, mixed use cylinder maybe, um, and maybe even a battery and solar. And if you can almost get to the point where as much as possible you're optimizing for self-consumption and then you're also importing a little bit of energy into into the house as well um, when required that's a very different model than we have uh, than we have today and it's uh, quite an exciting future i think and opens up a whole new range of businesses i mean it's it's you know when people talk about the green economy and the kind of businesses and they are thinking you know principally about you know, electric vehicle manufacturers or battery makers but actually there are a wealth of opportunities for new business in all these ancillary services that are springing up absolutely yeah and, and, and obviously you know i i get to to be the, be someone who helps to develop some of those solutions within British Gas Centrica. But what's exciting, actually, I get excited about all the other activity that's happening, you know, around the organisation. Because although, yes, I work for an organisation that's you know advocating that, and I really want us to to be an important part of that. We'll play a part of that overall solution, and I get just as excited about you know what I see some of the startups doing and, and what others are uh, are doing, I guess, in the market. So, um, so absolutely, yeah. This is, seems like a moment, Tom, to ask you for your vision of the future of transport. Where do you think um, it will be in 10, year, in 10 years' time? Yeah, really interesting question. I think there are, uh, there's probably four themes that I start, I think about when I, when I think about the future of transport. Um, the first one, which may sound like an obvious one, is the move away from uh, internal combustion engines over to electrification um, for the actual vehicles themselves. Which may, in, in, you know, today as we sit here, sounds like a very um, obvious point. But it's important to remember, you know, that was even going back maybe a year, two years, that was still a debated topic. That debate no longer exists for small vehicles and for uh, vans up to a certain size. Uh, electrification is the future. I don't think anybody's really debating that now. I think there's still a few people hanging on to hydrogen for. Um, for those vehicles um i just don't think that's going to be a, a solution i guess um at scale certainly for uh, for small cars or cars and, and small vans um so that that electrification i think is now a bit of a done deal i think it's going to happen it's more about how we get there um for for larger vehicles so you know hdvs and, and bigger vehicles I, I still think there's a good debate there um to be had and there are you know some people who are very much on the on the side of if hydrogen will be the future for, for these big vehicles and some that are still on the on the electrification space uh, it's likely i think there'll be a mix of both um but it but hydrogen is a is a whole other interesting kind of topic um 
you know, which I'm quite you know, close in the organization about how we do that for, for heating um, and for industrial uh, kind of uh, solutions as well. So yeah, hydrogen has an, an interesting part to play. Um, I'm, I'm not sure we'll play a major part in transportation, maybe a little bit at the, the higher end potentially. So that's kind of the first big kind of change, that electrification. Um, the other one, which is an important one, is, the, is that transition from, from, from private cars to alternatives. So we are kind of past the, the peak car, um, uh, peak private car ownership um, kind of bubble, certainly in the UK. And what we're starting to see, uh, as everybody knows, is we're starting to see fewer people um, you know, owning private cars, particularly in urban areas, particularly in, um, uh, in younger uh, generations as well. Uh, so we're going to see fewer cars, especially in those urban areas, uh, and a move towards other forms of transport. Um, and that could be walking, um, could be cycling, um, e-scooters and scooters are obviously on the rise quite significantly in urban areas. And interestingly, um, we start, we've seen that, I guess, through the pandemic uh, in terms of the number of people that have really got out and started to, to walk and to cycle. And certainly when I'm in London, um, you know, I very rarely get the tube now. I quite like the idea of going to Waterloo and they're having a 30, 40 minute walk. Um, it's quite pleasant, even uh, even when it's a bit chilly in the winter. So I think that that transition from private cars to alternatives is a, is a key theme. Um, shared mobility solutions. And, that, and by that, I mean everything from uh, mass transit, um, which when you really look at it pragmatically, has to be the way to go. The best way to move people at, uh, at, at scale and efficiently is, you know, via um, mass transits, so whether that be um, trains or you know um underground type systems um and uh, and then all the way through to you know growing um businesses and startups focused around um you know, shared mobility in form of taxis or, or, or other things and then closely linked to that which i see as much more future focused and certainly not my specialist area is that autonomous mobility solutions which are very exciting um but still i think a bit of a way off and then lastly the one we've talked about actually which is the coming together of, uh, of transport and uh uh, and home energy. So, yeah, so a number of those um, key themes that are, are coming out. And I, what excites me actually is that uh, about why it's better actually, because, uh, you know, the obvious one that people always talk about is reduction of carbon emissions. Um, and we all know the kind of benefits of that. But what the other angle on it, which uh, I read a book uh, a few years ago now um, called Cleaning the Air by Tim Smedley, which I'd recommend to anybody. And what's really interesting is the uh, the different approach of, yes, carbon emissions is really, really important, the reduction there. But actually, to think about it from a, an air quality perspective, um, and actually, in the last, I think, that, and there's been more stuff that's come out of this in the last year, I say, that actually, the the health benefits of moving away from internal combustion vehicles is, is significant. Uh, and actually, being able to provide cleaner air for our communities, for our children, for everybody, um, you know, actually it's pretty life changing in terms of what it's costing us in terms of um, you know, impact on everyone's health. So and, and the great thing about air quality and taking that angle is actually that's a very local issue. Like the, the, the one that, I, you know, you speak to friends sometimes, they always talk about, well, China are building a power station, um, you know, every five seconds or whatever that st stat they make up. Um, but actually what's important about air quality is it's local. So carbon emissions sometimes feels like it's a you know, almost a, an out there kind of thing that people don't really kind of get, but air quality, people get that. And I think, again, during the pandemic, we've seen that in terms of how air quality improved when people started um, traveling less. So there's two biggies. And then I think lastly, in terms of why I think it might be, it's better actually is, is congestion. So, you know, in terms of congestion today, uh, and going back to that point, I'm moving to more shared mobility and, and mass transit, um, you know, that, that makes a real improvement as well. So yeah, that, that's my thoughts there, definitely. So Sandrika finally is very well placed to take forward that particular business agenda and return for investors in that merging of home and transport energy provision. Yes, absolutely. Um, and if you look at, you know, I always think about what are the all the component parts that we as an organisation need to, um, you know, to deliver that and support that transition. And it goes from the very, um, you know, straightforward pieces around insulation and maintenance of, of devices in the home. So, you know, for a long time now, we've been installing, whether it be boilers um, or other devices into customers' homes. We've been um, maintaining, you know, um, both electrical and, and gas appliances in the home for a long time now. So that's a great starting point for one of the biggest workforces in the country, you know, respected and, uh, and a fantastic group of people. So we've got that foundation. But then... When you add in the fact that we have uh, the Hive um, platform, the Hive app, 
which is used by, you know, as I said, too many customers are ready for, for, for the connected home. We have that ability for customers to interact with um, an app and a solution that allows them to support them on that transition, I guess, towards net zero. Um, and then in the background, we actually have um, those flexibility services. As I said, you know, we, we have the ability to connect all these devices up to our virtual power plant um, and help balance the grid both nationally and also locally um, as well. And then we've got a pretty big energy supply business uh, uh, as well. So we really do have um, all the component parts. And we actually have had those for, for quite a while. Um, and I think what's really exciting, I've seen the acceleration over the last, last year, is actually all those are starting to come together. And I very much internally, I see myself um, and, and my team and everybody I work with is, we almost take that an enterprise view. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, not all those component parts sit under me directly. What my, my, me and my team's role is to do is to bring all those elements together, whether it be the flexibility services um, uh, and that kind of platform, bring that together with that front end solution and installing a charge point with the Hive app um, to control and manage it. So that's why I'm really excited actually, because we can bring all those uh, those together um, and that creates great solutions for customers, but also as, a, as an organization, um, that creates a quite an exciting future for us and a real opportunities for, uh, for, for growth actually um, and margin opportunities as we move forward. Tom, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. No worries, thank you. Mm -hmm.